Today is the 5th of June, uh, 2009. We are at the home of Mr. Uh, James Haynes in Norwich, New York. And uh, my name is Wayne Clark. I'm with the New York State Military Museum. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth? James A. Haynes. I was born in Norwich, New York on 10 October 7, 1925. Okay. And did you attend school here? I attended all Norwich schools and I graduated from Norwich High School on in June of 1943, I guess. Okay. Or four. Could be four. I think four. 1944. When you graduated from high school, did you go into the service immediately? Not immediately. Uh, I, I, uh, at that time, I, I wanted to go into service. When I was a senior in high school, they came through requesting uh, candidates for the Naval Air Corps and the Army Air Corps pilot training mm -hmm. and also <clears throat> Army Specialized Training Program and uh, what we call V-12, Naval Officer Training. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I wanted to join the Naval Air Corps, so I took the aptitude test and passed that, and they sent me to Rochester. I took the train from Norwich to Utica, and then the train from Utica to Rochester, and stayed overnight in the YMCA in Rochester, and uh, took the the physical test for the Naval Air Corps, Naval Off Flyers uh, that next day, mm -hmm. but uh, they wouldn't accept me because I had third degree flat feet, which they say prevented my eligibility for the Naval Air Corps. So I graduated from high school and my father moved to Clinton, New York, and I spent the summer after graduation, working on the Hamilton College campus in Clinton, mowing lawns mm -hmm. and working for the grounds department. And then my father and mother agreed that I could enlist, but my father said not in the Army Air Corps. So I enlisted in the Army in Utica and took a physical which lasted about an hour mm -hmm. in Utica and passed it and was sworn into the Army that summer. And then, in, while I was still living in Clinton, in September, I received a notice in the mail to report to Fort Dix in New Jersey in November. I think it was 1944 then. No, mm -hmm. it was 1943 still. Okay. I was only 18. The same day I received a draft notice. This day I left for Fort Dix, I received a draft notice from the local draft board telling me I was drafted. Mm -hmm. But I left with my father and he took care of. I went to Fort Dix and reported there and was outfitted. Now how did you get to Fort Dix? Was it by on the train, the train from Utica okay. to Newark. And then I I think a bus from there out to the camp. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, I don't remember that. Okay. And I was in Fort Dix for a couple weeks. And Was that your first time away from home for any long period of time? Definitely. Mm -hmm. I've never been away from home for any long, any period over a day or so then. Mm -hmm. And uh, how much time did you spend at Fort Dix? Probably two weeks. I know after I got to Fort Dix, we were barracked and, and uniformed 
and mm -hmm. given our, our Army issue uh, uniforms and other things, and then stayed in camp there, but I contacted a strep throat, and so I had to go into the hospital there for a week or so with the strep throat, uh -huh. and I missed, I think, a shipment out, which would have sent me down to uh, uh, Virginia to uh, uh, an Army artillery outfit for training. Mm -hmm. But then when I got out of the hospital, I made, they shipped me, they, you, you used to get up, up in the morning at six o'clock in Fort Dix and go out and fall out and they call a roll, make sure you were there, and then they would call out a list of people who were being shipped out to some training camp. And I, I, I think the shipment I received was a training camp in uh, Camp Cross, South Carolina. Now, when I took the physical in Fort Dix, after I reported there, it was a longer one. It took a couple of hours, mm -hmm. and it was more uh, detailed. And they told me then that I had flat feet and wouldn't, how about going in the Air Corps? And I remember what my father had told me, no Air Corps. I think he was concerned because <coughs> at that time the B-17s were having a bad time over Germany. Mm -hmm. And I said no. So I ended up in Camp Trough, which was an IRTC, Infantry Reception Training Center. Okay. And I ended up in the special uh, company there the 26th Battalion, which was Intelligence and Reconnaissance. Now where was Camp uh, Croft? Down near Spartanburg, South Carolina. Okay. It's no longer. It was a basic infantry training camp then, mostly for uh, people in the infantry. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or line soldiers. People who, uh, but we were in a special company I think because of my IQ. Uh huh. And what was, what was your training like there? The training was basic infantry, learning uh, weapons, the M1 rifle, and the uh, light machine, submachine guns, grenades, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And bayonet training, and mostly uh, physical exercise. But we, we had uh, uh, observation training, things like that, map reading, specialized that the infantry guys didn't get. Mm -hmm. Now how long did that training last for? I think, to my recollection, it would lasted about six months. Oh really? That long? I think so. Okay. I'm not sure though. It was in... Uh, December, late December when I got there, <coughs> and uh, I can't remember how long I was there. I, I know when I was in the, I, you joined a company, a whole company, that had a lieutenant and a mm -hmm. sergeant, and they took you out all the time for all the training. I remember, I uh, developed uh, a skin disease on my feet, athlete's feet, mm -hmm. and uh, near the end of my, at the end of each uh, training period, whether it was three months or six months, there was a camp out for a month. You had to go out in the field and camp. Yeah. And when I was near the in that let just before that last month, my mother, who lived in Clinton, New York, died and I had to go home for her funeral. I had to leave to do that. So I missed the camp out. Then when I reported back to camp, they said that I couldn't uh, finish the training. I had to finish the training with another 
company, uh -huh. the, the camping, before they could do anything with me. So I missed shipping out with all my uh, company trainees, all the buddies I'd made. Uh -huh. And they all shipped out to uh, a uh, embarkation camp in Maryland, Fort Meade, I believe. Uh -huh. I uh, fit, went back with another company and finished the training. And then they shipped me out alone or with a couple other guys to Fort Meade. But I understand, I'm not sure of this, that at that time they uh, adopted a rule not to send 18-year-olds overseas as replacements where all my previous company had gone to England. So they shipped me instead from uh, Fort Meade down to Camp Butner in North Carolina to the 89th Infantry Division. And I joined a battalion, their first battalion of the 355th Infantry Division, uh, of the 355th Regiment in battalion headquarters mm -hmm. with an INR patrol where I served in that division, mm -hmm. and we went. Over, we were shipped overseas as a division uh, later in th that year. Okay, so uh, so no. that would have been in 1944. You were shipped over. I think it. I think we lasted until 1945. Okay, I think we were shipped when we when our division went overseas. It was in January of 1945. Oh, okay. Right after the Battle of the Bulge. Uh huh. All right. So, so you were there t towards the end of the hostilities. Very much so. Okay. We uh, went overseas in January. In, in the middle of Jan I think we landed. We left January 10th from Boston. Uh huh. And, uh, now, did you go on a convoy or single ship? On a ship, on a uh, a cruise ship called the USS Uruguay, uh -huh. which was an old cruise ship, where one where part of our division went on other ships too. Uh, it was in January. It was rough, rough seas, and uh, in a convoy. Mm -hmm. Did you get sick at all? I didn't, but most of the guys on the ship did. Uh -huh. I served KP and d didn't mind it at all. Didn't bo never bothered me on the ocean. Uh huh. How was the food? Food was terrible. It was two meals a day. Um, mostly breakfast in the morning, not really breakfast, something to eat at all. Uh -huh. And then uh, supper at night. And uh, the food was no good, hmm. really. And we were thinking of eating our. They had we had an issue of sea rations, and we were thinking of eating those. The food was so bad, uh -huh. but we didn't. And how long did it take you to cross the ocean? I think we were on the on the ship. Ten or fifteen days. I'm not sure. It's a long time. You all slept in the bunk beds. You couldn't sit up in them. Mm -hmm. You could just lie down in them, down in the hole. Yeah. There were probably six or seven guys stacked up over you, and then along, uh, and then a uh, a toilet that was always messy and smelly. And there no showers or anything. Uh huh. Yeah. I think we landed in France on the 10th of January. I'm not sure what day it was. Where, whereabouts did you land? Outside Le Havre. Okay, right in France then. Yeah, it was one of the coldest nights of that winter. Uh huh. We had been on that warm ship and they got off the ship 
and went, they put us on these big uh, flat rig trucks <coughs> on benches and sat there, mm -hmm. and I think it was 10 degrees below zero, ice cold. We sat there and for probably a couple of hours, freezing. Then they trucked us to a, camp, a new camp they were starting, one of the cigarette camps called Camp Lucky Strike. Okay. And in the Lucky Strike they had tents. And first it was just icy cold and, and they had uh, very few food facilities to feed you. So again you were only getting two meals a day. And snow covered with snow. Uh -huh. And after we were there a week or so, the snow melted and it got all muddy. Uh, now, was your clothing adequate? Did you have warm clothing and boots? We had the standard army boots were not weren't too warm. Yeah. And we had uh, overcoats and, and that's it uh, pretty much. And wool, wool uh, shirts and pants, mm -hmm. ODs I think we called them. And uh, that's what that we were. We had tents, and they gave us little stoves. We could, you could take empty cans and make a stove pipe out of the cans by uh, pushing holes in and tying them together. Uh -huh. uh, so that, and we got had some wood and a little coal. Did uh, did it heat the uh, tent enough to stay warm? It was just about. Uh huh. Yeah, we weren't ever really warm there. Then we were there a week or two, two or three weeks. I think, and then some of the guys in the mine companies went out and helped remove mines in the minefields around there. This was an old German airfield that we were, our camp was on. Mm -hmm. And we'd go out on hikes through the countryside to keep in shape. Uh -huh. Did you uh, make any contact with the enemy at all there? None. And there was no enemy there. This was uh, the, after the, this was at the time the Battle of Bulbs was taking place. They were so we had no contact. We were a long ways away from uh, okay. the enemy at that time. We we were still in France near Le Havre. And of course the, the fighting was then in the Belgium and uh, the Ardennes and up in Germany, the border of Germany. Mm -hmm. well, we used to see the air raids. They'd go over every night the uh, thousand plane air raids. Yeah. The sky would be covered with planes for an hour or two. It's any, anywhere you looked up in the sky, you'd see the, the bombers going over. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, heard the noise of the drone, but it wasn't, that's about it. Okay, and then uh it, it, at one point, you ended up with Patton's army, the Third Army. We, we, we uh, were in France there for a couple of weeks, as I said, and then they they sent us they sent us they took us on trains in the box cars. Mm -hmm. You know, the so many horses and so many men. They, they call them forty and eights. Forty and eights, and we went from on trains up to the uh, uh, German border in Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then from there they uh, we joined the Patton Third Army, the 11th Armored Division. We hooked, our division hooked up with the 11th Armored Division. Mm -hmm. and we drove and went into action in uh, near Aachen near Trier in the Moselle Valley mm -hmm. and with the 11th Armored Division, our division cleared the entire Moselle Valley. 
What what sort of resistance did you encounter? Not heavy, occasional resistance. Mm -hmm. I think the first time, uh, first we used to travel in convoys. Of course, we had at the infantry division we had very little, few vehicles. Uh, our section had a jeep and a lieutenant and a sergeant and. Uh, I think it was six enlisted men in our section. So we we if we we didn't ride in the jeep. The lieutenant had the jeep, and and he went with the armored divisions at a point. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we rode in six fives and in in a column. And the first first resistance we had was one. Uh, we the column was fired on by, uh, uh, I think they called them Nufu Warfers, we call them Screaming Meanies, mm -hmm. rocket guns uh, were fired at us and uh, one of the rockets hit a truck behind, it hit in the, not a truck, it didn't hit the truck, it hit the ground behind us and the shrapnel injured some of the men in the truck behind us mm -hmm. and that was, that was the kind of action we got. The points, of course the columns were miles long and uh, the points were always getting some periodic uh, action but they clear it out and go on. They had, we had tanks, plenty of tanks in the 11th Armored and those guys were uh, really good. Uh, so we cleared out the Moselle to the Rhine. Mm -hmm. And then one of our regiments jumped across the Rhine in a, in a small attack boat and, ma and made a, a landing and a bridgehead. And then the division built a pontoon bridge. Mm -hmm. And we crossed the Rhine on the bridge with planes overhead and uh, then went on into Germany mm -hmm. to a town called Weisbaden which we captured and then then I think the 11th division left us and we were attached to the uh, 4th Armored Division mm -hmm. one of Patton's better armored divisions. The 11th Armor was a great division too. They were great soldiers. They were, they had seen a lot of action. Mm -hmm. Of course we were, we were sort of like the 106th that got uh, pretty much broken up in the Battle of the Bulge. They were on line. Mm -hmm. We hadn't seen much much action like that, and if we'd been there, we probably would have suffered the same thing they did. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, come across any concentration camps at all? We 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 uh, when we were when we went into Germany after we had a week's rest in a town called Rudesheim on the Rhine River. Mm -hmm. After we crossed the Rhine and took Weisbaden, they took us back to the Rhine and we stayed there a week. And then we went with the 4th Armored all the way into Germany. And we were the first division to capture a concentration camp, which was a small one called Bad Ordruf. And, uh, it was the first concentration camp that was captured. It was uh, a very small one, but it was large enough to break us up. Had you heard about concentration camps no. before? No. We'd heard about Germans and SS and like that. And of course, mm -hmm. they had given us resistance along the way and killed some of the people. I was in the 1st Battalion and we had an A Company, a B Company, a C Company, and a D Company. And A Company took quite a few casualties on our drive through the Moselle and uh, into Germany. Uh, 
but we hadn't heard about concentration camps. This is the first I'd ever seen one. Mm -hmm. I've got pictures of it in my division history. Were there uh, still German soldiers there when, when you took it, or had they fled? They had all fled. I think they'd taken the inmates that were living on a march then, mm -hmm. had uh, marched them out, but there were still, it, actually outside the office of the camp, there was a concrete, uh, well, I don't know what to call it, a, a flat concrete, piece of concrete. Like a slab? And, what? Like a slab of concrete? Yeah. And on it were 30 or 40 dead people who had been machine gunned. And right next to it were gallows that were unoccupied at that time. But outside the fence, when you entered the camp, there were two dead inmates in their striped mm -hmm. pajama type clothes lying. And then Next to one of the huts where they lived, in bunks like we had on the ship, uh, wooden bunks, there was a uh, shed where they had bodies laid out, dozens of bodies, just skin and bones, mm -hmm. with lime on them so they didn't smell. And then there was a railroad track going from the office way out into a field. At the end of the field there was a big ditch and in the ditch there were railroad ties that had been burned and on top of that bodies that were partly burned. It was a very, very, uh, I can't, I don't know how to describe it, terrible well, sight. Yeah, very the, disturbing. At that time that I saw it, the next day after it was captured, uh, uh, General Patton and General Bradley came to see it, and I think Eisenhower, but I'm not sure of that. I, I know I saw two, the Patton and Bradley there, mm -hmm. and they were uh, there looking at it. Well, of course, they captured much larger camps after that. We never got one of them. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have any encounters with Patton? Once, when we were in a column going through uh, central Germany, we came to a crossroads and he was, there was a jeep there and he was standing by the jeep outside of it, just like a statue with his white pistols on his side, uh -huh. looking at us and saluting as we went by. That's, a, that's the only encounter I have with Patton. Uh -huh. Did you have any encounters with the Russians at all? Well, not not in combat. I did later after the war. When after the war ended in Germany, we were in Germany near Chemnitz, about a hundred miles from Berlin, mm -hmm. and the Russians were only ten ten miles from us. I didn't see any. Um, all we saw were German coming through our lines, German soldiers and convoys mm -hmm. to surrender. But they sent us back to uh, Camp Lucky Strike had done on a train. Yeah. And we thought we were going to be shipped back to the United States, but we didn't get shipped back. We stayed in Lucky Strike to operate the camp, but we didn't have to operate the camp because German POWs operated it. They did all the driving and the cooking mm -hmm. and everything else. And we didn't have to guard them. They were working and uh, prisoners that did what they were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So I had I was young only, well, I was just 19 then, and I didn't have enough points. We had battle points but, and service points, but being so young, I had not enough to go be shipped back home. So they sent me to Austria, in Enns, Austria, for 
for occupation duty, mm -hmm. and then from there to Vienna, where I did occupation duty, and there I had contact with Russians in Vienna. We, uh, our company picked up German prisoners of war who were mostly Hungarians from the Russians mm -hmm. and took them to the Prater, P-R-A-T-E-R, which is the playground in Russia, the park uh -huh. where the Ferris wheel is, and guarded them while they cut wood because it, the winter was one of the coldest winters they'd had mm -hmm. and they needed fuel to, for fires. So the, the prisoners cut wood, we guarded them, and then took them back to the Russians. Then when I didn't do that, I pulled guard duty on the canal in uh, Vienna, mm -hmm. which at a place where they had a storage for food in Vienna. And the Russians would come along and talk to us at that place where I had to, you had to go out and patrol the uh, area where the food was stored. Uh -huh. and so I came into contact with them then, mm -hmm. but not not really heavily. Uh -huh. How did you get along with them all right? Well, you were, it was difficult because they were armed and we weren't. We, we couldn't uh, carry weapons with us in Russia. I mean in Vienna. But the Russians did. They carried their AK-40, whatever weapon it was. Uh -huh. I think it was an AK-47 then, or a machine gun. We we had rifles, but we couldn't take them with us. So they, uh, we were warned that they weren't to be trusted and uh -huh. not to be alone in their area. Okay. How did you get along with the civilians? Very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The civilians were uh, very hungry and they used to line up and try to uh, get food we discarded that we didn't eat after yeah. we lined up for food. Yeah. And, uh, but they were friendly with us. I, I remember I went to the opera with a uh, couple of Austrians. Mm -hmm. And that was interesting. In the opera, the Russians would come in and sit in the balconies with their guns against the railing, and we were in the orchestra without any weapons or anything. Not a very pleasant situation for us. Yeah. How long did you do occupation duty? Well, I was, I think I was shipped to ends in the fall of 45 and then left Vienna in the, sometime in the spring of 46. Okay. In April, I believe. Probably six months. All right. And you were discharged in April of 46? Yeah, at Fort Dix. Okay. Now, while you were overseas, did you see any USO shows or? Get any leave time at all? My recollection, yes, but I don't remember exactly what. Okay. Yeah, I don't. Uh, we saw some, and the Red Cross was always there, with donuts and coffee when we were shipped around. Mm -hmm. But I don't remember seeing any big stars uh -huh. overseas. All right. Um, you left in April. Uh, did you go back uh, ship by ship, probably? Yes. In the, and I, I forget where I got the ship. I, it was the Navy uh, ship. And I remember I, I don't know which port in France it was. It might have been Lahar, but I'm not sure of that. Mm -hmm. I got on the ship and uh, with, of course, soldiers I didn't know, had no knowledge of at all. I had been all, all by myself in the occupation. 
the other my, others in my company were in occupation too in Austria with different uh, outfits. Mm -hmm. But I got on the ship, and they I was a private first class always, and so they gave me KP. I remember I went down to report for KP on the ship, and the Navy chef and that ship said, saw me and he said, you're Jim Haynes from Norwich, aren't you? And uh, he, I knew him and he was a, uh, a, his last name was Charles. One of the Charles boys, I went to school with one of them. Uh -huh. And he said, you get good duty. So I did duty at KP for him all the way back across the ocean uh -huh. for eight or ten days. Uh -huh. And how was the food? Food was great. Was we, we, we ate officer's food. <laughs> Cinnamon buns and uh, everything you wanted. Ice cream. <coughs> Never had eaten like that. In more than a year. Uh huh. And uh, what was it like when you got uh, back to the states? Was there any kind of celebration at all? Definitely. We came into the New York Harbor, and all the uh, boats were in the harbor, ferrying fire boats, ferrying water, uh -huh. to welcome us. Yeah, it was a big, big celebration. Not uh, like probably some of the guys got, but. Mm -hmm. They they uh, welcomed us. All right, and you landed, and then they ship you to Fort Dix. Fort Dix, yeah. And then they went through the the procedure, discharge procedure. That meant uh, physicals and uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, request to volunteer for the reserves before before I. Uh, uh, was shipped home. The captain of the company I was in in Vienna. I can't think of his name now. Called me down and said uh, said uh, uh, soldier, you've got a good record and a high IQ. Did you ever think of staying in the army? He said, you, How would you? How about going to West Point? And I said, sir, I don't want to stay in the Army. I've had enough of that. And uh, so I didn't. Mm -hmm. and then in Fort Dix, that's what made me think of it. They asked me to join the reserve. And I said, no thanks. No reserve. Uh -huh. <coughs> so actually, it was a good thing I didn't because when I was in law school, there were several guys that have been in re stayed in the reserve as officer to keep their rank yeah and they were called for korea to korea uh -huh. yeah uh one i remember specifically was a, a naval uh, uh pilot from utica what's called i had to go fly. he had to go fly. he didn't fly go to korea though he went down to uh, Florida to Pensacola and taught guys how to fly. Mm -hmm. So he came back and practiced law in Utica, but I was really happy I didn't get called back. So once you were discharged, you came home, and, and then obviously you made use of the GI Bill? Well, that's another story. I had a... Uh, as I said, I had an attack of athlete's foot, or uh, uh, it's, there's a medical name for it, and I can't think of it now. And it it was prevalent. It never was really cured. It it was prevalent, obviously, on my fingers and on my uh, feet uh -huh. when I was discharged. So they gave me a five percent disability. So that I was getting five percent disability in the summer. My father knew a, a, a ate lunch with a man in Binghamton. That's where he was living then. Told me to 
there was a special program for disabled veterans called Public Law 16. Mm -hmm. So I had to benefit that. I had to go to Cornell to take aptitude tests to decide what I was qualified to study for, which I did. And then uh, I had the advantage of Public Law 16, which was somewhat better than the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. It gave you more money per month and paid for more books and things like that. So I had Public Law 16 through my education until toward the end, the last year I was on my own. So um, whereabouts did you attend school? I, I attended Hobart. That was a tough thing. I, I, was, I applied when I got home, it was in April of 46, I guess. Yes. And of course all the schools were filled then with veterans, it was hard to be accepted. I applied at several schools and was accepted, but not for a year. Mm -hmm. But the superintendent of schools here suggested that I tr apply to Hobart. And I'd never heard of it, but I applied and I was accepted for the fall of, of that year mm -hmm. and went to Hobart. And then I and when I was in Hobart, I, I, I had decided I wanted to be a lawyer, and I qualified for that under the Public Law 16 test. So I applied to Albany Law School in my June, in my sophomore year in Hobart, and was accepted. Then they accepted you with three years college, pre-college, in law school. Now I don't think you can do that. So I was accepted in Albany Law School before I graduated from Hobart and went to Albany and graduated from there. Mm -hmm. I married uh, Shirley here and uh, before I w entered law school, no, the first year in law school, 49, uh -huh. I graduated from Albany Law School in 1962. That came back to yeah, Narwhal. Yeah, 52. 52. 52. Yeah. Okay. Came back to Narwhal. I wanted to go in the FBI, but Shirley wouldn't let, didn't want me to. <laughs> so I <coughs> came back and practiced in Narwhal with a a woman who was a, and her husband. The woman was an assemblyman there, and finally went into a partnership with uh, another Norwich lawyer who was a county attorney. And then he died and I took over as county attorney and, and uh, was a, almost 25 years as a county attorney before I retired mm -hmm. from that job. Then I stopped to practice with law oh, quite a few years after that. Now you mentioned that uh you were on the Selective Service Board? Yes. I was a government appeal board agent for the local Selective Service Board. The mayor, I forget who it was that asked me to serve. Do you remember? I, I can't remember who the mayor was then, but he asked me to serve. And so I agreed to do it, and I served in that position for several years. Mm -hmm. So, so basically, what did that job entitle? Entitle. Uh, That's very difficult. I had the help of a of a lady who worked for the draft board permanently, and she. Mm -hmm. I used to have to go down and interview. Uh, a select a service designees to see whether they qualified for. Uh, uh, religious, uh, I see. Yes, or things like that, mm -hmm. or to review appeal board papers to see if they were qualified. And I can't remember exactly what all I did, but it wasn't easy work because mm -hmm. I still was a uh, patriotic person and thought you should fight for your country and 
not to uh, object to serving your country. Mm -hmm. Well, that was difficult for my idealism. Sure. But you had to apply the law, and that was it. Now you did that until uh, they they stopped drafting. I can't remember how long I did that. I did it for quite a long period. Mm -hmm. Was that during the Vietnam? It was all during Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you eventually retired and uh, settled here in Norwich, stayed in Norwich. Mm -hmm. Now, have you uh, uh, joined any veterans organizations? Did I what? Join any veterans organizations? Yes, I, jo I joined the American Legion and I enjoyed. I joined the Veterans Forum Wars, mm -hmm. and I, I fi finally determined in my mind that that was too many, I mean, one would have been enough. Mm -hmm. So I uh, think I re resigned from, maybe it was, a vet I think it was the Veterans Forum Wars, and w we lived on a street here in Norwich in an apartment upstairs over a uh, guy, a Norwich person who uh, had served in the Marines and and he was a member of the Veterans of Foreign Wars and he came, after I got out of that, he came by one day and said, and convinced me to rejoin. Mm -hmm. Which I did, and so I've always stayed in the Veterans of Foreign Wars. I've not rejoined the Legion. Uh -huh. um, have you stayed in contact with anyone you were in the service with? Definitely. I've got, of course, our, we had a, an INR section composed of a lieutenant, a staff sergeant, and I think six or seven private first class. Mm -hmm. um, the, the lieutenant was a great guy. He was an armored, he had armored basic at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that one of the six privates in our section had attended the University of Illinois with our lieutenant, and he was in the ASPC program. He had gone with our lieutenant to officer's candidate school, mm -hmm. but had been flunked out because he was colorblind. Wow. And then there were two other, three other privates in our section that had been an AS, the Army Specialized Training Program, and which was discontinued, and they were shipped to our division, into our section. Mm -hmm. And the other three of us were just young guys like me, 18 years old, who had no college training, and they called us kids. So those guys were the, the seniors, but we bonded. Uh -huh. Very well. We were in training in North Carolina together for a long time, and then shipped overseas together, and then in mm -hmm. in combat in in Luxembourg and Germany. All that the short time we were there, six seven months, mm -hmm. and we bonded. And of course, you bond. I think you bond with us with the, your fellows and the, and the army. Yeah. So. Uh, one of the guys in our section was a a Chinese guy from San Francisco. He was a his grandparents had been Chinese immigrants, and he had grown up in San Francisco. He was named his name was Sidney Atai, but we all had nicknames for each other, and we called him Ching. <laughs> And uh, he was a brilliant guy, and the lieutenant, he was also a hero. He won the Silver Star in action 
in uh, Germany with us, and uh, he was a lieutenant's driver, the point, and the chief was usually the point of a task force whenever we were in a task force. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's dead now. He died shortly after he was discharged with cancer. Yeah. But the lieutenant is dead now too, but the other ASTP people stayed in contact with him after the war. I didn't, I sort of got lost because my father had moved from Utica to Binghamton and they lost me. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know, I didn't see any of those guys. We finally, I, how did they get in contact with me? I thought Bill sent you, found you and well, sent you away. Yeah, so they found me and I met, uh, uh, we had one guy, his uh, name is, uh, he was a Texan, he was from St. Louis, his father had moved to St. Louis from Texas, and, and he, Bill Simons, we called him Deadeye. He was a great rifle shot, he could shoot anything, I mean, he really could shoot an M1, he had a, more than an expert rifleman, he could, he could mm -hmm. fire a gun really well. <coughs> And uh, he, he, he found me, he, he worked for uh, Proctor Gamble down in uh, Staten Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had been looking for me, trying to find me. We had a division uh, uh, society and they had reunions. But I never was aware of it. Mm -hmm. until he found me, and we had a reunion down in uh, Hyde Park in the Culinary Institute. We had lunch. Oh. He suggested that we eat lunch there, and so we went down and drank champagne all one afternoon and <laughs> discussed uh, our experiences and what had happened to some of the guys that were in the section. Uh -huh. There's only uh, Three of us left now. There's two in Oregon. Dead eyes in Oregon. We we went to an arrow hostel in Asheville, Oregon, on the Shakespeare, uh -huh. and he lives right outside Asheville. And my other buddy lives near Eugene, Oregon. So we're we're still in close contact. Mm -hmm. I had one in Buffalo who just recently died. Wow. Yeah. What was the fellow's name in Buffalo? Heldwine. Bob Heldwine. H-E-L-D-W-E-I-N. Okay. Yeah, we do interviews out in Buffalo. I, I didn't recognize the and name. There was a guy, our staff sergeant was from outside Buffalo. Forget the name of the town. Sergeant Winters. Mm -hmm. But none of us kept any t contact with him. We didn't care for him. Mm -hmm. How do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? Well, I think probably a great deal. I learned uh, discipline, mm -hmm. which I needed, I believe. And I learned uh, how to use my time and to put effort into things. And I, I think I, I learned discipline of studying and like that. Mm -hmm. Do you think had it not been for the GI Bill you would have gone on to become a lawyer? Could be. My father always had aspirations. Of, he wanted me to go to college and not join the Army. Mm -hmm. But we were not a rich family so uh, I don't know how he could have handled it. Mm -hmm. Okay. They had several sisters that were all bright and did well in life, and studied and like that. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. Oh, I hope it's helpful to you. Oh, you, you did well. Thank you. Okay, you, uh, you mentioned the concentration camp. Why don't you come over and take a look? Uh, First, then you'll see what we've got here. Well, I can I can zoom right in on it. All you have to do is hold it up in front of you. Okay.
and you and you can explain from the from the uh, photo. Okay, that's all right. Let me zoom right in. The, the picture of the bodies laying stacked up like cordwood. Then there's a picture of the bodies on the concrete who all have been, have been machine gunned, I believe. Mm. And then there's a picture of the ditch with the railroad ties in it where they burned the bodies or buried them, the ones that were killed. There was a railroad track with a railroad car going out there. I don't know how long the camp had been open. But there's also pictures of officers, I think one with a hat like Eisenhower used to wear. Okay, and what was the name of that camp again? Ordruff, Bad Ordruff. Okay. All right. And o O R D R U F. All right. Were there any other photos you wanted to show us? Not, not in the book here. There's many, many. But okay. All right. All right. I, I, I got that. You can, you can set that down okay. if you like. Okay. Uh -huh. And that's your unit yearbook? This is the uh, uh, 89th Division, 1942-45. Okay. And by chance, do you have like a large photo of you in uniform? That, uh, remember the ones they said, one. what have you got? You know where that box is? It probably one in there. That or in the garage. What? <laughs> I said either that or it's in the Yeah, okay. Well, okay. If maybe you could send us a copy of one of those photos, I can include it in the uh, in the folder that we do on each veteran. If you could leave your uh, address, that sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, we could we could uh, try to dig one out. We've oh. moved a couple times, and that's hard sometimes. Okay. All right. Thank you again.